quorum being present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A few quick remarks. I've been asked to, when you're speaking in the microphone, please try to talk right directly into it, because apparently it's been tough for you people to hear. So to talk directly into it about four inches away. Uh, second thing, Ms. Hillary has a point of personal privilege. Ms. Hillary. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Jennifer Hillary, Precinct 7, and this is my fifth year on town meeting. And for a couple of years now, I've been thinking about and speaking with others about an idea that I wanted to share with you all. I've speak, spoken with our town moderator and fellow town meeting members, Tom Grant and Eric Burkhart, about creating a town meeting guide or a training at the library, with perhaps recorded with the help of RCTV, a town meeting 101, so to speak. It would be a chance to share basic information with new town meeting members about how town meeting works, from how precinct meetings are run to how something becomes an article on the warrant, and it would be a chance to answer questions about town meeting. We have some great resources that already exist that we can draw from, including a history of town meeting on our website and a couple of videos that our own town moderator has created about town meeting. I would love to recruit a couple of seasoned town meeting members and perhaps some new town meeting members as well to assist in these efforts. I know our town moderator and town clerk have both expressed interest in being a part of this as well. So if you're interested in assisting, please see me after town meeting or feel free to contact me um, in another manner. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Before we proceed, I thought I'd make a quick explanation. Uh, we will have a motion to take Article 20 out of order so we can start with the budget tonight. We do that to try to make sure we get the budget done in one night. After that, presumably we would go back to, uh, we would table Article 16, then we would start with Article 17, 18, and 19, and then if we have time, we would go to 24 and 25. So we have a motion from Ms. Alvarez to take Article 20 out of order. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? None appear. Oh, I'm sorry. Discussion? Mr. Coco, do you have discussion? Oh, second. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, is there any uh, further discussion? None. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 20, Mr. Lalasher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> I'm going to stand up and briefly give a discussion about how we're going to approach the next, uh, you know, hour or so of presentations. Um, on the first, on the first slide here, you'll see an outline, a framework of what we're about to do. Um, in your budget book, from pages 32 to 43, there's introductory remarks. We're not going to cover those tonight. Um, probably the single most important page for town meeting members in order to follow the votes and the discussion is page 43. That's a one-stop shopping for all the lines you're going to be asked to vote on tonight. So for instance, on page 43 in the top section, there's something called shared costs. Um, we'll go over those. The next set is all the different town departments, and most town departments have a wage line and an expense line that are voted on separately but uh, the facilities department is arranged a little differently. The, f the third piece is the school department. The superintendent and school committee will come up and give a presentation on the school committee uh, or the school department budget. And that is a single line item. The school committee alone has bottom line authority. Town meeting can only approve a number and then the school committee and then the superintendent have a right to how to spend it. And then we'll finish up by uh, hitting the enterprise funds. And uh, thanks for your vote on Monday. We now have a fourth enterprise fund, so there'll be a surprise new number uh, put in for the PEG access of 600,000, which we'll get to. So on page 43, you'll see the number at the bottom, 116 odd thousand. Because we're adding in the PEG access that was just created Monday night, that total will go up 600,000 in the main motion. 
Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our town accountant, uh, Sharon Angstrom. She is going to describe things like, revenue, uh, like revenues and cash, and nothing to do with how we spend the money, but just to give you a background, and then I'll, I'll come in and explain how we spend money. Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Bob. So we start with the budget process always starts with our reserve position and the town started off fiscal 19 with just over $11 million of certified free cash. There is a proposed use of $1 million to support the fiscal 20 budget tonight, leaving us with just about $10 million. And then we have stabilization funds of just about $1.6 million and then FinCom reserves just shy of $11.8 million, which represents 11.9% of our net available revenues. This slide is the history of free cash over the last 10 years projected out for three years. The projected amounts, um, we used a um, conservative regeneration figure of $1.5 million and then $1 million of use in each year. The red line approximates where that 7% um, reserve minimum that FinCom has a policy that we maintain. This slide just talks about how free cash is regenerated. There's two ways. First, you collect more revenues than you project, or you spend less um, than you budgeted. The two com combined are your full regeneration. In recent years, we've had very healthy regeneration numbers. So $1 million of free cash use to support the operating budget tends not to have a negative impact on our overall reserves. This is the projected fiscal 20 um, revenues as compared to fiscal 19 projected revenues. You'll see that they're up 3.1% over a prior year without free cash use and just 2.9 with free cash use. We opted to reduce free cash use from $1.2 million in fiscal 19 to $1 million. I figured I would go through kind of the line items and how we arrive at those budgets. So property taxes are up 3.2. We arrive at that number by taking our levy and increasing it by 2.5% and then adding in our estimate for new growth. Local revenues are excise taxes, meals tax, those sorts of revenues, fees, permits, um, interest revenue. And that's up 4.6. The two big drivers within that category are excise tax, which tend to come in above projection no matter how much we increase them. So we've increased that projection year over year by $100,000 for excise tax. And then also interest income. We are seeing much higher interest rates um, on our returns. Um, and so we are seeing outpacing of what our current projection is. And so interest income is up 150, 150,000. State aid is actually always um, projected at 2.5% above the prior year. That's based on a FinCom understanding that that would be what we use because the budget for state aid is just not known when we start this process. The agreement is that if it falls short of that 2.5% at a later town meeting, we would use free cash if needed. And then transfers and available funds. That's where you would see enterprise fund supports coming in from water, sewer, stormwater, RMLD. You'd also see um, the earnings distribution from RMLD. And on Monday, we learned that that earnings distribution has been frozen for the next several years. So there's no increase. And that's the biggest number in that grouping. So you can see that's why the increase is very small. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator, if I may ask for more than 10 minutes. Is there any uh, problem? Nope. Mr. Well, I should go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned this. Here's the numbers behind it. Um, there's sections of the budget we'll go over, but you can see the red uh, numbers, which are a little small to see. That's just the addition of the 600000 uh, the PEG Access Fund. So, so I'm going to first go through the shared costs, which are up fractionally 0.3%. 
Then I'll go through the town government costs, which are up just about 3.5%. Superintendent will go over the school budget up a little more than 4%. Those three components make up um, the spending on our general fund, which has to match the revenues Sharon just described, which is 3%. Um, to just say a few words about the override, first of all, thank you. But secondly, the override did not change the amount of revenue that comes in as a percentage basis each year. So we've collected about 3% prior to the override. We'll continue to collect about 3% increases. But it certainly raised the baseline. Um, the override um, made the increase that year something like 8.5% instead of 3%, which is very helpful. But we are still constrained by Prop 25 we will still expect to spend approximately 3% a year on in, the, in the general fund. That hasn't changed. And then it follows up with the four enterprise funds, which I'll get into in more detail. Uh, the total budget motion in front of you is up uh, just a little over 3%. In the shared costs, there are actually five different line items that, that uh, town meeting will be asked to vote on. I'll go into a little more detail after this slide on each. Uh, benefits is close to zero. It's the biggest number in this group, certainly, and it's just over uh, a half a percent increase. Uh, capital and debt can be thought of as a pair. Um, this year, capital spending is being reduced because debt spending goes up. FinCom has a policy of spending approximately 5% of all the budget, general fund budget, on de debt and capital combined. So that goes up proportionally every year. Um, we have students at three different vocational schools. Um, those combined budgets are expected up 4%. The largest portion goes to the Wakefield uh, Northeast Metro Tech, and we, we know what that assessment is. We do not know the others because we do not know how many students will be there next fall. Um, Wakefield does it on a one-year lag, so they count this year's students for next year's price. The other Vogue schools honestly don't even tell us sometimes until this time of year what it costs for the current year. So we have a hard time budgeting that, which is why sometimes we have to do an adjustment at April Town Meeting. And then lastly, uh, FinCom has the reserves, and as part of the override, they had discussed wanting to increase the amount, which hasn't increased in at least 15 years that I'm aware of. So again, these shared costs combined are close to zero, just a little bit higher. The benefits being the single largest line, I'll spend a little more time on it. There's an independent retirement board that decides what our allocation is for that. Um, they are guided by some state, state rules, state law. Um, the retirement is up almost 6%. That increased a few years ago when the stock market had a hit um, because they do have a target date of when the, fund should, when the um, uh, pension fund should be fully funded. Um, the town, many years ago, more than 25 years ago, paid as it went, which uh, many, many corporate sector employees did 50 years ago. They only paid whatever the retiree's cost was that year. They didn't plan for the future. So there is a, a large component of this retirement fund that is still playing catch up from, from employees that retired 30 years ago, never mind started working here 30 years ago. Um, in less than 10 years, when this is, is caught up and fully funded, as it were, um, there will be a approximately a million dollars or so reduction in this line item. Philosophically, um, we'll have a discussion, certainly well before that, but our, our OPEB obligation, which you saw on Monday night, could certainly use some or all of that amount as slack, and that's been the general plan is OPEB is being funded at about half a million a year. It should be two plus million. This would be one way to increase that. And the penalty for not funding your obligations is this retirement line. If we had funded it properly all along, and I say properly, but people didn't know 50 years ago what that meant, this would cost a million dollars less. Um, <clears throat> the other numbers are comparatively small. Again, part of the override did fund these lines. So for instance, we don't need to increase our Medicare number. Um, I mentioned health insurance on Monday. This, the budget is a minus 1%. We still don't have a full run rate of all our employees because we hired during the year for the new positions from the override. But probably by August or September, I'll have a pretty good idea 
there should be excess in that line, but I don't know how much. We'll talk about it at November town meeting. And the other numbers are relatively small. In case you don't recognize indemnification, that is work effectively workers' compensation for police and fire. We self-insure for that. Again, debt and capital should be thought of together. Debt is just a way to f finance capital. Um, the, the debt schedule and the capital plan have excruciating detail on that. Um, this is just a high-level summary, which I really won't go into. Um, probably the single most important line is we are due for a, a new fire engine. Um, you know, many years ago, we would uh, borrow for these and do them. We would stretch out when we needed it as long as possible, which led to pretty high maintenance costs of fire engines. Um, <clears throat> we have got a very good plan of how many years a fire engine can last, 20 years generally. And it, line, it lasts 10 years as a first line and 10 years as a backup. Um, so that's how we look in the debt schedule. You will see for 10 years planned out all the ladder, the ladder truck and all the fire engines, what the replacement schedule is. I mentioned previously I don't like to spend money on interest. It's not useful. So we are able to spend $800,000 a year without borrowing for it if you plan. So that's what the approach here is. Um, the next biggest number and, and most important one is road, road work and sidewalks. And anyone that's driven the town in the last month or so will understand uh, we can use all the help we can get. Um, in addition, an article uh, later tonight will accept almost $600,000 from the state. So combined, we'll have a million too. Um, this is something that Reading, believe it or not, despite the interesting conditions of the roads, we do very well. Many of our neighbors, especially cities, only spend the state money to fix their roads. They do not do any on their own. Um, that would be half the amount we spend. Uh, one of the penalties of being Reading is we are a cut through town. That's just a fact. There's a lot of non-residents that cause this expense. We'll try to slow them down and make them shop, but that's just one of the things we're dealt with. Um, there's nothing terribly interesting or exciting um, in the rest of these. Uh, but I do want to circle back to the uh, Elder Human Services van. You can see a $75,000 number there. That's because there's also a $15,000 playground. Um, we actually heard from the speaker, or from the uh, minority leader today, Brad Jones, that in the final House version of the budget voted today, there is $60,000 for the senior uh, van. So if it turns out that that survives the legislative process over the next few, few months, um, we won't need money for it, but we, we really want to keep the money in here because you never know. Um, but that was good news. Um, there's also some uh, safety improvements on Lowell Street and a, a possible relatively small amount, but certainly appreciated for the building security uh, in the House version of the budget. This is a summary of the uh, debt service. And for the first time, as you have seen on Monday and you will see further next week, we are asking for authorization on debt. We actually haven't had to borrow uh, really since the library building project. Um, so some of these numbers are estimates because we don't know the cost of some of the unsold debt yet. Uh, but within the levy, it's about two and a half million dollars. Um, you can sort of see the breakdown, 800,000 from schools, a projection of 560,000 a year for building security, uh, turf 2 that Dr. Doherty presented on Monday, um, 300,000. And the, the two things that are new are building security and turf 2. All the rest is an obligation we already have. Uh, importantly, uh, another component of debt is uh, debt that was done outside of the Prop 2 and a half levy. And that's things that were approved at the local ballot uh, by local voters. It includes the high school project with two small amounts for some elementary schools and the library project. And on all three of those at this point, um, compared to other municipalities, we're in great shape because by 2025, we'll have no more debt outside the levy. That is very unusual in municipal finance in Massachusetts. Um, we paid the library debt down faster because we knew, and you will see, other needs in the future. You know, elementary school space, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, as Mr. Brown says, you reach into one pocket or the other, it's all the same money, and it's his. Uh, but nonetheless, this will be a noticeable decline in people's tax bill if we do nothing. It'll be a three or four hundred dollar reduction by having this debt paid off. The 
invokes education again we know the wakefield number we estimate the rest that's the best we can do um, from what i know right now um, the number could be less but i also know at one of the vogue schools there's an enormous amount of applicants from reading at it and we have no idea how many if any will be accepted and interestingly no matter how much we ask them they don't seem to know uh, even in october or november how many are there you'd sort of think they would but we have a hard time with that and both the superintendent and I have tried. And lastly, on FinCom reserves, again, they wanted to increase the amount for the first time in quite some time to 200,000. Um, the 150, honestly, just doesn't go as far as it used to. And the point of FinCom reserves is when going to this body is not convenient, um, it's for emergencies, it's for unplanned things. It's not for bad planning, it's for things you couldn't have foreseen. Um, we haven't actually used FinCom reserves in some time. Uh, but when we need them, we need them. So after this town meeting concludes, all we have is the 200,000 from FinCom if something happens. Now there is a, sort of an arcane corner of state law which we have used once in 15 years, which would allow us to have a joint meeting between the select board and the FinCom and consider moving something from a line that has a surplus to a line that has caused you an unexpected problem. But again, that's a very unusual and rare thing and only was used once for some uh, Board of Assessors expenses <coughs> in the month of June. <coughs> I'll now move from the shared costs into that large middle section of town governments, town uh, departments rather. You can see the departments we're split into for budget purposes. Um, you'll see something called public safety. That's actually got four components, most notably police and fire. Um, but that is aggregated and historically always has been. Um, there's a variety of increases and decreases. Some years it's more uniform, this year it's not. Um, I will remind uh, folks that the override funds were mostly spent on public safety, so other departments this year have larger increases, most notably uh, the library and public services. And again, we'll get into that. The first pair of lines are G91 and G92 administrative services. Uh, Matt Cronellis is our administrative services director and I'm bu ombudsman. Um, wages um, are going up 3%. There's two offsetting forces. There are less scheduled elections in FY20. Paying election workers you know, a wage comes out of this budget. Um, but there is an addition of, as you can see, 20 and a half hours net uh, for support staff in the town clerk's office. Um, if you need details about the things I'm talking about, there'll be a time after this to certainly ask questions, but there's also a great deal of information in the warrant report. Um, expenses, uh, there are some additional technology replacement costs uh, related to the fire department, um, which have not yet been decided, but something is going to change. We just don't know which system yet, and that'll be, uh, if this is approved, that will be a discussion that starts in July. Um, there is new funding proposed for the Cultural Council. Um, you know, there's, it's a small, modest amount, but for them it'll certainly increase the amount of grants they can give. And this is something that I would have liked to have done a while ago, uh, but before an override could pass, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. But now I'm happy to be able to propose that. Um, last year, as part of the override, one of the things the town did was propose one-time expenses so that we could then use the money for something else. Not many of them, but one of them was $40,000 in organizational-wide HR training. Um, we have cut that amount quite a bit for next year, as we said we would, and put it to other purposes. Um, <clears throat> there is an ongoing archive project that we got grant-funded, so there's a reduction or actually elimination of our funding of that. And again, there's a lower election cost because there's one less election. Next is public services. Um, again, from your budget book, you can see the details, and, and certainly I welcome questions. There are several small increases in hours. Um, the elder service, elder, human elder services administrator um, is going up uh, and adding more hours. That's worth seven tenths of an FTE's increase. We have added hours for a health inspector, which we've already used this year. Um, we are trying to use two vans when we have two vans that work much more often for human elder services, so we have added hours or proposed to add hours for more van driver hours. 
we've reduced hours for the senior center coordinator. So that's a combination of increasing um, some clerical support and increasing the human elder services administrator's hours. So there's a net increase uh, to the division. Uh, and then we have just modestly increased some hours for a recreation position. In terms of expenses, um, there is uh, a one-time outsourced professional services work that recreation needs. I think it's $4,000. We have increased some economic development expenses to support community events. So for instance, um, we agreed to and are open-minded for next year to support the Fall Street Fair. So I think we paid them a modest amount, uh, thinking that was economic development related, certainly. We have um, proposed an increase in expenses for regional affording housing. Um, we're in a current four town arrangement on, in the Reading budget, you see 100% of the expenses as part of the revenue that Sharon uh, described. 80% of the costs come in as revenue. So we're one of four towns, we're one of the smaller ones. Um, we pay 20%, 20 cents on the dollar for the service. And that may uh, add another community. The um, decrease is, is clear and evident in our veterans support. Uh, we're losing our veterans, sad to say. Um, we were on a pace several years ago of going well over 200,000 very quickly. Um, that actually has not happened and now we've, we've decreased the need for veteran support. And so you're aware, um, one year later as part of state aid, the town gets 75% of whatever we spend in veteran support back. So we're essentially paying 25%. The finance department is comparatively much smaller. Um, I, I should have mentioned Jean Delios, the assistant town manager of the department head for public services, Sharon Angstrom, the department head for finance. Um, the assistant town accountant position that was added as part of the override, we need to supplement the funds just a little. We got a more well-qualified candidate than we could have hoped for, so that has worked out very well. Um, she's also borrowed back some hours that we shared with the town clerk. Um, you saw that the town clerk had an addition of 20 and a half hours. That's partly made up by adding a full-time position, cutting a full-time position, and pulling back hours from a full-time position that was shared with finance. So they're retrieving three-tenths of an FTE from the clerk's office um, and adding it to the collector's office, which will be very helpful. Uh, we are keeping our two-town regional assessing arrangement with Wakefield. It's worked out excellent. Um, in this case, it's a Wakefield employee, but we can't pay it as a wage. It's an expense to Reading. It's a wage to Wakefield. We pay half of his wages, but again, it shows up in our budget as a line item of an expense. And then um, because we have had some new staff and, and the new assistant town accountant, there's a modest increase in professional development expenses. As I mentioned, public safety had four pieces, two of them easily recognizable, other two very important. Uh, police and fire, more recognizable. Um, our CASA, our Substance Abuse Coalition, and Dispatch, the other parts. Um, I'll describe each in more detail as I get to them, uh, but the combined uh, change, again, is, modestly, is a modest one except for our CASA. You can see it's almost a 4% increase but 150,000 of that increase is because we need to fund our CASA on our own, and I'll, I'll get to that. In the police department first, we have Deputy Clark uh, representing the department tonight. The override funded five new officers. One was the school resource officer, the second SRO. Although we had not hired a new officer by August, we did assign um, one of the current officers to be the SRO, second SRO for the schools in order for the school year to start with two SROs. Um, then, if you will, we, we hired five new officers because one got moved. So there's four new officers, um, and that has taken some time to acquire them um, and then to get them trained because there are training academies which have difficult schedules and they're often very full. Um, we've, we've done it as quickly as we can. Um, the, the numbers that ultimately will come out in the FY19 budget um, will not show much of a reduction in overtime that should be seen in FY20 once it's fully staffed. Um, but the budget certainly in FY19 looks more than adequate. 
We've also added some crossing guard funding just because every year the demographics of neighborhoods change and we want to be able to add another crossing guard if we need one. It's, it's certainly a modest cost. For expenses, um, this is another one of those one-time expenses, part of the override. We hired five new officers. There's a great deal of startup expenses associated with those positions. It's taken care of in the first year, and especially for uh, clothing and training, it's then reduced. We have kept and did not intend to keep uh, a third cruiser in the funding plan. Um, last year, as part of the budget discussion, we went from two to three replacement. Um, with the expectation we'd drop down to two, and that third one was a one-time cost. Just due to the wear and tear on, uh, on the police cars, we want to keep it at a third level. And, and someone asked me, um, why don't you do this as part of capital? One of the qualifications of capital is it has to have an expected life of five years or more, and our cruisers simply don't meet that criteria, so they must be funded by the operating budget. Otherwise, there's plenty of vehicles in the capital plan. If it weren't for that, they would be funded as capital. <laughs> Our you know, Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, we just actually had a meeting an hour or so ago. Um, the superintendent and I um, had agreed prior to the override that even if it failed, we wanted to keep this going. We had to keep this going. The level of funding potentially could have been less if an override had failed but we agreed to 150,000 uh, shown, as you can see. Uh, the federal grant, we will not be eligible for again because we've had um, the maximum amount. The actual federal grant ends on September 30th, so theoretically we could have just asked for three quarters of what it will cost, uh, but our budget practice in Reading is to always show you the full cost of a year, during a year. So if all goes as planned and we spend 150,000, um, one quarter of that will be from the feds and three quarters of it will be from the town and we'll give the rest back to free cash. But that'll then build the proper baseline for FY21. We've asked for it, it's there. Um, there is a slight increase in the FTEs and, and thus the $150,000 number. Um, in the early years of the grant, we were at two FTEs. We had a couple of grants combined. We lost some of those and had to drop down to one and a half. The plan is now to go back to two. Um, the expense budget is lower than it would, would be or is under the grant. Um, as, as a board member for our CASA, that's something we've talked about in terms of doing more fundraising in the community. Um, we cannot fundraise for wages, but we can fundraise for expenses for such as programs. Um, so there will be an appetite, certainly for our CASA going forward, uh, to acquire more uh, money for expenses. Chief Burns is here representing the fire department, um, and you can see that um, you know, wages and expenses, again, have done something similar to the police, that the one-time costs and expenses uh, drive that down. There was four new firefighters in this budget. The fire department's in civil service, so the hiring process is a little different, uh, different and a little more complicated than police. We were only able to add one new firefighter last summer from the list we got. We had to wait until a list came out in late November before we could even consider adding the next three. Uh, fortunately, we were, were able to find three good candidates in that list and hire them. Um, something that hasn't really appeared in your budget with much acclaim is the fact that the chief and the department uh, were awarded an extremely competitive $600,000 grant to pay for new firefighters. Um, it, it would have been quite a discussion if the override had failed, whether we would accept that grant because we are on the hook for having those four firefighters forever. Um, the grant pays more in year one, less in year two, less in year three. We've not seen any funds, so we don't really know what the cash flow will be, but it'll be approximately $600,000 over the next three years. And the way our budget process works, all that money will go directly into free cash as, as it arrives. Um, and again, much like the police department, there was a significant amount of one-time costs for um, clothing and, and giving safety equipment to new firefighters and, and to train them. And last but certainly not, not least is the dispatch function. That's a job in town that I never really quite understand why people want to do it because it's extremely stressful and very uh, high-paced. 
and not very much downtime in Reading. Um, we have had some turnover in staff. We've had two very long-term employees retire over the last few months, and that's caused some vacancies which are hard to fill, and it has increased the use of overtime in FY19. Um, when fully staffed, um, the budget is very adequate uh, for overtime. For those new to town meeting a few years ago, um, town meeting was, was kind enough to add two new dispatchers, and they virtually paid for themselves by eliminating overtime needs every year. So when fully staffed, um, you know, we still think that'll be the case. There is a grant shown as an offset to wages and expenses. It's not guaranteed. It's from a reverse or from 911. Um, the division will see some increased technology expenses. Um, you'll also hear on Monday that they are in the center of some of the building security that we'll talk about um, reworking their space. And Jane Kinsella is here representing Public Works. Um, there's lots of moving pieces in Public Works, but the total budget is up about 3%. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple components, and again, I'll first go through divisions. Uh, wages, um, as, as Jane just became the director recently, uh, Jane and I sat down with other members of her staff and effectively redesigned the org chart. You'll see there's another department that did the same shortly. It was quite a lot of work, quite a lot of time. Um, it's a good opportunity, especially when you have a new person in charge to do that. We also had some turnover, so we had a more op of an opportunity. But for any of you that are hiring, younger people, 22-year-olds, 25-year-olds, 28-year-olds. They don't make them like they used to. <laughs> um, we have found it very difficult to get seasonal pe people to work seasonal hours. So what we've done is reduced the amount of seasonal staff and increased modestly the amount of full-time staff. So it's about a wash. Um, we've also sped up the ability for new uh, employees to climb up in the wage path faster. Um, we were just seeing too much turnover. Um, someone would come for a couple of years, get excellent training in Reading, and go apply their skills somewhere else. Um, that's not a good idea for the organization. For, so, so for relatively short money, um, we're able to just pay them faster. Um, engineering wages, we also had to increase certainly more than would be a typical. Um, engineers are probably one of our um, jobs that is most alike the private market. Uh, any of our engineers can get a much higher paying job in the private sector. We just have to pay a reasonable wage, and we did that. Um, it, we have gone through periods of time of having one of the engineering positions open for as long as two years, because it is, it is very hard to hire good engineers, again, for what the public sector will pay. In both public works and facilities, you'll see some new line items in the details. There are some new safety requirements by OSHA. Not a lot of money, but just so you know, it's new. Um, you'll also see in public works and facilities some new line items for turf maintenance. The people responsible for the turf fields and the owners of the turf fields are complex, but public works is responsible for the turf field at Parker Middle School, and so they have funding to take care of that. One of the other lines that public works has that's voted on separately is, is snow and ice. Um, philosophically, this is usually an interesting discussion. Um, you can see from the, the red line is actual, it's volatile. Um, some, the green line is the budget. The uh, other dotted line is a 10-year average. So you can see two out of the last five years, the actual expenses have been below budget. Some years, they've been phenomenally higher than the budget. You know, if you've done your own driveway, you know these things. Philosophically, should we fund this budget higher, closer to a long-term average, we could. But when we do that and don't need the money, we haven't hired a teacher, hired a police officer, a firefighter, what have you. So philosophically, we know and intend to underfund this line. And this is the only line in the town budget where that is done on purpose. We don't want to waste money in years we don't need it. Um, most years you will see a transfer request because of that philosophy. This year it was only $45,000. Some years it's been as high as four and $500,000. Um, one of the other tricks in this line item is if we were feeling especially robust one year and we increased the budget, 
we can never drop it again, that state law. So we have to be very cautious about increasing the budget for this line also. The two other lines voted separately are street lighting and rubbish. Um, you know, that's, that's a complex area. Um, again, town meeting approved a 10-year contract a few years ago. Uh, thank goodness you did. Um, we've had vendors just leave municipalities high and dry. The market is totally upside down. It's chaotic. The recycling market has essentially collapsed. Um, buyers overseas are not interested in our material anymore. And just as an example, um, one of the vendors decided to get out of the business in municipals because it wasn't profitable. And all of a sudden, Stoneham had no one to pick up trash or recycling one day. Um, thankfully, we have a 10-year contract, but we also have, um, with Jane's help, a really good relationship with the vendor. We, we understand the business conditions are very tumultuous. We work with them. Um, we've gotten really excellent service back from them. Amy Lannon is here to represent the library. The library is, as part of downtown government in many ways, but they are separate with a different board. So they have a board of library trustees. Um, I mentioned another department did a significant reorganization, and this is it. Um, Amy spent quite some time thinking about it, talking to me about it, talking to the trustees about it, talking to a lot of her staff about it. And if you read the budget right up in the book, you'll see what she's doing. She's preparing the staffing in the library, not only for the new building, but for the future. Um, library science is changing rapidly, as you would imagine. There's not as many books in libraries. There's quite a lot of communication and technology. So Amy has had that in mind and, and done a fine job. Um, as a result, more of their money is directed at wages and less is directed at expenses next year. Uh, the materials budget, by, by, I guess I'll say by law, um, must be a certain percent of the total library budget. In Reading, that number is 13%. It used to be 15% until our population went above 25,000, and for whatever reason, uh, the requirement then drops. Um, the budget in front of you is only funded at 14%, but it's well above the 13% requirement, and the trustees would prefer, would prefer to, again, fundraise as they need to uh, for any other materials that they find that they're short of and again, prefer to direct the money at wages. Um, it is a beautiful new building. It's a larger f footprint. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to say, as they said they would, they have really not added much staff uh, to cover this space. They've done it very well. <coughs> Last, Joe Huggins is here to represent the facilities department. There are three, three pieces of the facilities department, I'll say. Um, there's town buildings which you vote on as a separate line. There are school buildings that are a subset of the school department line. And then there is something called core facilities, which is shared things between town and schools. And you can see, uh, by far, the core is the biggest amount. Um, I've, I've asked for a feedback from town meeting uh, over many years. And one of the recommendations was stop being so transparent in the facilities department. Please make it look smaller. So there's a lot less detail now in the facilities department, and I haven't gotten any complaints yet. Um, but we used to have many pages of lots of detail, and it really isn't necessary. So we're always open to your suggestions. Um, sometimes we get opposing suggestions, make it more, make it less. But this was one where town meeting was fairly unanimous, that we just don't need to see all the detail in facilities department. Um, energy costs are not always known in advance, depending on our contract status. Um, we estimated 4%. There is that new turf field maintenance line. The facilities department is responsible for the two uh, uh, high school turf fields. And this would be directed for the stadium field, since turf two uh, will not need this uh, next year. Um, in the town building's budget and in the school building's uh, budget that Dr. Doherty will go over, there's uh, pretty large increases in outsource, outsourced services. Um, we have custodians, both of us, but we do not have as much custodians as you would need to do all the work. And it's always a balancing act, how much you want to outsource, how much you want to do yourselves. Um, generally speaking, the outsourced work is work done at night. Um, it would be more expensive for the town or the schools to do that work at night. Um, 
because you have to pay a nighttime differential as well as the all benefits and health and, and pension costs that go along with it. Um, but that's something that we do study from time to time. But you'll see in both the school and town budgets that's driving a larger than normal increase in those budgets. So at this point I'd like to turn uh, the presentation over to Dr. Doherty and perhaps the school committee chair and I'll be back shortly to talk about the enterprise funds. Dr. Doherty. Ms. Webb. Mr. Moderator, thank you, uh, town meeting members, select board, finance committee, town manager, town meeting members. In January, the school committee una unanimously approved the FY20 school budget of $46,467,348 for a 3.6% increase over the FY19 budget as aligned with the Reading Finance Committee guidance. The school committee would like to express enormous gratitude to the voters of Reading who supported a Proposition 2.5 override in April of 2018. The additional revenue has had impact across our district. We have K-6 to six curriculum coordinators for STEM and ELA driving instructional excellence in our elementary schools. At our middle schools, we have maintained our foreign language program. We have added back teaching positions at Reading Memorial High School while decreasing class sizes and increasing elective options for our high school students. We have added important oversight for our special education programs, and we have enhanced and updated our curriculum, staff development, and technology. In short, our students today are enjoying the same high quality of education that Reading students have traditionally enjoyed and that our residents, all of you, have come to expect. While there is much to celebrate, there is an area of the budget that we would like to highlight. Over the past several years, we have seen significant increases in special education cost center of our budget. Our students with special needs are presenting with more complex and serious issues that impact their ability to access the curriculum. As special education programs and services are, are federally mandated, these costs are often beyond our control and are growing at a rate that far outpaces our revenue. Reading is in no way unique in this regard. Escalating special education costs are creating budget problems across the Commonwealth. We will work with our town and state representatives in working towards a sustainable solution for these costs. We are grateful to the voters of Reading for their generosity and we take seriously the trust that you have placed in us with the additional revenue provided by the successful override. We are also very grateful for our ongoing collaborative relationship with the municipal side of our government, particularly the town manager, the town department heads, the finance committee, and the select board. We are grateful for our central office staff and administrative team and all of our educators who work every day very hard to help our students grow, learn, thrive, and succeed. Our school department and school committee budget process is exhaustive, it is iterative, it is data rich, setting a standard of excellence among peer districts. And I would add um, a note of appreciation to many members of the finance committee this uh, past budget season who spent um, most meetings with us. We want to recognize tonight uh, Superintendent Darty, our Chief Financial Officer Gail Dowd, their administrative teams, and all of the principals for their commitment and outstanding work. Finally, we are grateful to our students and their parents, all of you, who make Reading Public Schools the most wonderful place to grow and learn. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Doherty to present the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Good evening, town meeting members. As Elaine stated, the development of a budget is not done in a vacuum. And on behalf of the Reading School Committee, I'd like to recognize the efforts of our budget liaisons who provided feedback throughout the budget process. In addition, I'd like to thank our team of building principals, directors, Assistant Superintendent for Learning and Teaching, Chris Kelly, Interim Director of Student Services, Sharon Stewart, for their efforts. Finally, I'd like to thank Chief Financial Officer Gail Dowd, who spent countless hours developing the budget that you have in front of you this evening. It takes a team effort to identify and prioritize the needs for the students of the Reading Public Schools. I appreciate everything that they have done. 
Um, in the warrant, the budget is on pages 99 to 161. And so I'm going to go through the, the different components of the budget. But first, what I want to do, um, and I know that in his opening remarks the, uh, on Monday evening, uh, Finance Committee Chair Eric Burkhardt talked about the override. I just want to also update town meeting from the school department perspective uh, where we are and all of the um, increases that we received. And again, we thank the town uh, for their support of, of the override. Uh, so there were 16 FTE teaching positions as part of that override. And as you can see there, the seven middle school, the five high school, three elementary teachers, and two to hours. Uh, we're all have all been filled at this point, and we again we appreciate um, the support there. We had some other staff additions, which it was four FTEs, two curriculum coordinators, which are two new positions, um, and that is obviously to help coordinate our K through six uh, curriculum areas of literacy, social studies, mathematics, science. We uh, restored a 1.0 FTE computer technician. And also, a, we added a special education team chair assistant director. Uh, we also had a salary adjustments to attract and retain staff, and that was actually spread out through all the different cost centers. Uh, in terms of expenses, uh, we've done curriculum updates and renewals, and we'll continue to do that in the FY20 budget. Uh, our focus on spending this year has been at the high school science and middle school social studies, as well as science materials at the elementary schools at the K-2 level. We've also had several professional development training opportunities uh, for our staff, uh, including math training, health, literacy, differentiated instruction. We've also uh, began computer replacement, uh, purchase of computer carts for the RMHS science department has been completed. And we're working with the technology department to obtain pricing and prioritize needs for the remainder of the spending as we continue to replace um, our older technology. We also restored the athletic schedule. If you recall, we were reducing the number of games across the board if the override was not successful. And we did restore the elementary chorus positions. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to fill those positions for this year, but we'll continue to try to fill those positions um, next year. So just a summary of the FY20 school department budget. This aligns with the goals and the mission, the vision, and our district improvement plan for the Reading Public Schools. Uh, you will notice that the budget that the school committee approved in late January is, diff is a, there is a $300,000 difference from the town manager budget, um, and that is because there has been a shift in accommodated costs, uh, which Elaine mentioned for special education. Um, we've seen an, an increase, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. So the, the budget um, that you are going to be re uh, reviewing tonight is $46,767,348. This budget includes a net increase FTE of following staff, and this is due to current and anticipated needs in both special education and elementary enrollment. We've now had two years in a row um, of uh, increases in kindergarten enrollment from the previous two years, which has resulted in some additional staffing, as well as some additional needs in special education. And you can see there um, on the chart uh, the equivalent of 2.95 FTE special education paraeducators and 3.5 FTE special education teachers to fulfill additional needs uh, with students' individualized education plans, and those are in-district uh, staff. Uh, the 1.2 FTE regular education teachers uh, is for grades K and 1 at Killam and Wood End Elementary School, and then the 0.6 FTE district-wide coach, behavior health coach, um, is a community priority, um, which was an, it's an, it's a accommodated cost for this year, and it uh, was previously grant funded uh, through the school climate transformation grant, very similar to the situation with the Arcasa positions in the town budget. When you take a look at the school department budget, it is set up a little bit differently than the town budget, and that's um, not because we want to be different on purpose, it's because we have to follow the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, uh, regulations and charter of accounts. So you see that we are broken down into 
five cost centers, the smallest cost center being the administration cost center, which is primarily your central office staff, support staff, um, and some district-wide costs such as our, our labor um, council costs, things like that. Regular day is the largest of the cost centers, and that really is all of the things that happen in the regular education classroom, ranging from the teachers, the building principal, the regular education paraeducators, the school secretary, uh, tutors, anyone that provides instructional services to the general, uh, general population of students, um, including all the instructional materials and supplies um, for those classrooms. Uh, special education is the second largest cost center, um, and that is all of the expenses, personnel um, that are helping to address a child's um, individualized education plan, uh, and also that would include out-of-district tuition and transportation. And then our school facilities uh, includes our uh, school custodians and supplies in our cleaning um, which Bob was mentioning earlier as well. And district-wide programs is actually cost centers which include, at smaller cost centers, which include athletics, extracurricular activity, our health services, which is primarily uh, our school nurses, um, and uh, our district-wide um, technology piece. So when you take a look at the, the, the different budget areas, it comes out to a total of the 4.1%. And again, that, that includes the um, the $300,000 increased in shift in accommodated costs from town manager's budget to the school committee budget. The other way we break down our budget is um, by uh, budget category. So the professional salaries, which is your largest, that is, that is your teaching staff, uh, your administrative staff. Um, the, clerical, the clerical salaries includes your um, secretaries and, and other uh, support staff in that area. Other salaries include your, your paraeducators um, and custodians and um, tutors and, and those types of support staff. And then contracted services includes uh, out of district transportation as well as some of our uh, cleaning services and, and things like that. Supplies and materials, use your curriculum materials and, and budgetary materials to help support the classroom. And then the other expenses include your uh, out-of-district tuition expenses. And then, as you can see, it's just a different way of taking a look at how the budget is broken down. Um, again, it's a, the 4.1% increase. So the financial drivers for this budget is all of the contractual step and COLA uh, cost of living adjustment increases for the represented uh, and non-represented employees. Uh, we are. Uh, next year will be the second year of three-year contracts with all of our five collective bargaining units, so we do have known uh, costs budgeting forward. Uh, also, our known increases with special education tuition and transportation expenses, and this is due to the increased rates that we know of and the types of placements that our students will be uh, in. We also have curriculum updates. Uh, in social studies, the curriculum frameworks was approved uh, last year by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And so now uh, we, along with all the other school districts in Massachusetts, will be aligning our curriculum. Uh, most notably in grade eight, we will be implementing a new civics curriculum uh, next year, and that's where you see the funding um, increase there. We also saw an increase in transportation in athletics and regular day. We also saw an increase in homeless transportation because we had, do have an increase in a number of homeless students uh, in, in our schools. And then we also are going to see an increase in contractual cleaning services at Reading Memorial High School um, and Coolidge Middle School. Uh, we are in the final year currently of a three-year agreement, so we will be going out to bid for that shortly. And then we'll be <coughs> also, excuse me, uh, renewal of some software programs and maintenance programs uh, in the district-wide cost center uh, for technology. So then there's additional positions that are tied to enrollment, community priority, special education needs. I gave it to you earlier, and this is how it's broken down even further. Some of those positions we had to hire in FY19 due to increased needs in um, 
students' uh, individualized education plans for special education, and some are projected for next year. So you see here it's, it's broken down uh, in, by FTE. The one regular education um, FTE you see here is the 1.2 FTE kindergarten and grade one teachers at Killam and at Wood End, and that is for enrollment purposes next year. We also, uh, and Gail Dowd has done a great job monitoring our revolving accounts uh, over the last few years, and so you will normally see some, some tweaks in our revolving accounts. Some go up and some go down, and this, this is due to the revenue coming in and the expenses that, that we knew use as an offset to the budget. And so you can see here that there are several uh, minor changes to revolving account offsets that are part of the, the FY20 budget. So some items not included in the FY20 budget, and this is the special education piece that Elaine was referring to, um, is we do have some potential settlements, known student placements, and unanticipated enrollment increases, or extraordinary special education costs that are related to out of district placement tuition, transportation, or other services. We are monitoring this closely, um, and we will continue to monitor it for the remainder of the fiscal year. And so um, the, the, there is a possibility uh, that we may have to come back at some point uh, to November town meeting or next April town meeting uh, for those increases in cost. But we are um, spending an awful lot of time tracking these and, and doing everything we can to, to monitor those costs. And certainly the shift of the $300,000 will help offset those costs. Thank you. Mr. Malajer. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we'll finish up by looking at the four enterprise funds once I can figure out how. <clears throat> First, for a brief overview of three of the funds, especially water and sewer. Um, both uh, Reading and both water and sewer does uh, partner with the MWRA. We buy water from them and we discharge our, our sewer through them. Uh, it's important that town meeting get a sense of how important is the MWRA to each fund because we can't control what they charge us. <clears throat> in water, that percent cost is much less. You can see in the table that 33% of our water budget is driven by MWRA costs, whereas 75% of our sewer budget is driven by MWRA costs. So that's an important distinction to understand. Um, things that we have much more control over, uh, local costs, uh, water is about the same as the MWRA, sewer it's relatively small at 14%. And then somewhere in the middle of we have good control versus M MWA, we have very little control, is debt and capital. We can plan it, we can spend it, um, but once we have sold debt, we can't change it. So it's a, a lot less flexible. Um, I just thought it was important for town meeting to get a sense of, you can see in, in water, for instance, the MWA is up a very modest 3.3% next year, that's their forecast but 4.5% the year after. So that'll have a certain impact on the water budget and likely the water rates. Um, in sewer, um, they're up 6% in next year, and that has a huge impact on next year's sewer budget, uh, but then much smaller amount in FY21. The select board did set water rates and sewer rates uh, at a recent meeting. Uh, water rates up just over 3.5% and sewer rates about 8.5%. Um, the prior year, there had been no increase, so year over year, they try to target 3 to 4 percent. Usually, water and sewer costs do go up faster than Prop 2.5 general fund costs. And again, the, the MWRA is a very large reason for that. Specifically in line W99, the Water Enterprise Fund, um, there's a small increase in wages. It would have been larger, except we transferred one employee from water to sewer. Um, the overhead expenses, things like pension, um, 
The pension assessment of the enterprise funds is always a bit of a mystery to me. The town accountant keeps explaining it to me. But once you transfer to another enterprise fund, the pension assets gathered on your behalf do not transfer. So sometimes this, this number can be quite volatile, as you can see here. Um, water and sewer also have new OSHA safety requirements, as I described in, in some other budgets. And both water, sewer, and stormwater to a small amount pay a certain amount of what's called support to the general fund as revenue. So for instance, a relatively small percent of my salary, because I do work for each, um, is paid in as revenue. And that's a common practice in every municipality. Uh, debt and capital is planned at almost flat for next year. And, this, and the total local costs are up a very modest 1.6%. Uh, add that in with the MWRA assessment, which wasn't too high for next year, and the budget's only up 2%. But the reason that rates had to be increased more is because there was a reduction in the amount of reserves used. Uh, much like free cash in the general fund is used uh, every year, uh, so it is in water and sewer and often in storm water. Um, comparatively, though, water and sewer have enormous reserve funds. Um, it, would, it would be as if there was 50 to 75 million of free cash for the general fund. And that's important because if you think of any one expense we could incur in the general fund versus spending 100 million, it's relatively modest. But as you saw on Monday, we had an additional 475,000 spent on just one capital project in water and sewer. So you need more reserves because the volatility can be quite higher for unexpected things. Uh, sewer, again, partly by the MWRA reason, but also, we, again, we transferred an employee from water that was needed in sewer. So you see wages, by comparison, seem to be up quite a lot. Um, pretty similar story in overhead expenses. Actually, a reduction in operating expenses, the same number for support. Um, again, part of my salary and several other employees. Um, debt and capital were increased. We have sewer station work we really must do. We're careful. We normally try to plan it uh, long term around expected uh, sewer, uh, MWA sewer cost increases, for instance. Uh, this year it worked out badly. Um, the MWA changed their forecast mid year and shifted an increase into FY20 that was expected later for, for whatever reason. So we have the, the double whammy, if you will, of we're spending more money in capital and apparently so are they. Um, so there is uh, an increase in the use of reserves for sewer and a pretty large uh, increase in the budget. And, in, and again, you can see rates are a lot higher. <laughs> One of the benefits of economic development, in addition to new growth for tax revenues in the general fund, however, is we are selling more water. We have new water customers. We have new sewer customers. So our fixed costs, such as debt, are spread over a larger base. So there isn't always a one-to-one -one correlation between the budget went up 9% and rates only went up 8%, and that's the reason, is we have more customers. In stormwater, um, the residential uh, charge is unchanged at $60. It was increased a year ago. There's no changes in staffing. There's nothing terribly interesting going on in this relatively small budget. Again, you can see a pension assessment that is large, uh, same OSHA requirement. We actually reduced uh, temporarily some capital and debt planning. This is such a small fund that when you have to spend $100,000 on a vehicle, capital spending soars. When you don't need it, it, it collapses. Um, so again, um, with a very smaller use of reserves, uh, the price can remain unchanged. Um, there will be a discussion with the select board, uh, possibly over the summer, certainly by next fall, about uh, future larger costs that may or may not be absorbed by this fund. Um, there are three river projects that have been on the capital plan and in the debt schedule since the fund was created, and we just keep pushing them out, so we really ought to talk about if we're going to do any work. I apologize, this is a little small to see, um, but we'll describe it in detail. This is the new uh, PEG Access Enterprise Fund. I'm going to get a little closer so I can see it. Um, what, it, what, it what it looks to be. Um, there's three sources of revenue, if you will. There's Comcast subscribers, 
there's a one-time or a series of one-time Comcast capital contributions, and then there's Verizon subscribers. Um, first, I'll mention that a team led by Matt Cronellis and Dan Ensminger uh, negotiated an extension for Comcast. Um, so they have a 10-year contract. Verizon still has about two years or two and a half years left on theirs. They're not interested in opening negotiations yet, but we will be negotiating another one with Verizon. They have already told us up front they're not willing to go longer than five years. So they will be up for renewal twice before Comcast is again. And uh, anyone familiar with the uh, field in general, they may both, both be obsolete by 10 years. We just don't know. And this is something RCTV is highly aware of. So you can see that the recent uh, track record is $560,000 to $600,000 of revenue. There's an increase in uh, FY19 because, again, of a large one-time capital contribution as part of the negotiation. Um, $600,000 is a reasonably close number to what we would expect for FY20. Um, let me talk a little bit more of that. We, we, we did a little bit on Monday. Um, <clears throat> if less than $600,000 come in, town meeting does vote to authorize 600,000, um, RCT will, will get what comes in. They can't get more. Um, if more than 600,000 comes in and town meeting has authorized 600,000, they will not get the extra. It'll stay in a reserve fund, much like water, sewer, and storm water, um, to be used in the future by vote of town meeting. So if they collect 600, if, if uh, Comcast and Verizon uh, pays 650,000, RCTV will spend 600,000. There'll be an additional 50,000 in a new enterprise fund reserve fund. They could conceivably come to town meeting at any time, at any town meeting, and ask to spend it, as we do for capital items. Um, this is new to all of us within the last 60 days, so there's not a lot of you know, significant planning. Um, but we did feel it, uh, you know, it was well worth more than $1,000 a time the town accountant gave them to charge them a modest $1,000 overhead a year, so they're really only going to get $599,000. Um, this is a rapidly changing field. RCTV is well aware of the business risks they face, and they have a board that is reacting to them and planning for them. Um, there's honestly no telling uh, where this $600,000 number goes in the future. Um, we'll just take it one year at a time. But I think the important thing for town meeting to understand is there is no taxpayer money used or at risk by this new fund. They will get the revenues that come in up to the amount that you have authorized. Additional monies will stay in the fund. We don't get them. They don't get to use them. They stay in almost like retained earnings uh, to be used in the future and roll over and, and again stay with the fund. So this is a bit of a new creation as of uh, January, we certainly hadn't expected this, uh, but the rules are what they are, and, and here we go. Um, I mentioned in passing on Monday that um, the RCTV board and, uh, and, uh, and we have uh, reached an agreement on an extension. Um, we have not signed it yet, but they've agreed to the business terms. Um, it is approximately a seven-year extension, um, and that's to fall inside of the Comcast 10 years for sure, and inside of what a five-year Verizon extension would look like. Um, so if everything continues with two carriers for seven years as is planned, we'll have a much better understanding um, and a discussion with you annually. We'll see how the technology evolves. Um, again, the RCTV board is well aware that the $600,000 number is more likely to go down than to go up from, because of alternatives, and they'll manage their business accordingly. But again, to restate it, it's really obvious for you to understand this is um, subscriber's money that is just passing through the town. And the reason the DOR wanted to use this access is to make sure all of you and the whole community had more transparency. Um, this is how your money is being spent. At this point, I'll turn it back to the moderator and we'll go back and go line by line and certainly happy to answer any questions. Thank you. First, we have a uh, FinCom report. Mr. Burkhart. Thank 
you, Mr. Moderator. As I mentioned in my comments the other night, uh, the Finance Committee uh, was able to attend many of the meetings where a lot of this detail was reviewed and spent our own time reviewing it in great detail. We believe it's a thoughtful, well put together budget. And on March 13th, we voted 7 0 to recommend this budget to town meeting. Okay, here's how we will proceed. I will uh, call out each uh, section, section B, then section C, D, there's 19 sections altogether. Uh, when I call out that section is when it's time to discuss that, that area and make any proposed amendments. At that time, we would vote on any proposed amendments, but we do not vote on the line items. We will only vote on the entire budget as, as printed or as amended. So we will begin first with line items in the B section, benefits. Is there discussion? Yes, Ms. O'Neill. Marilyn O'Neill, Precinct 4. I have a general question. I voted against, and I should have discussed it then, about uh, taking the budget out of order. I don't understand, and I'm not comfortable voting on the budget, which includes approval for that building security for plus million dollars when we haven't discussed it. So we're actually appropriating and improving the funds before we've had the opportunity to discuss it. I don't think that's the proper procedure. Mr. Lalasha. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the check and balance is clearly that you have not authorized any debt, so there's really no way we can spend the money yet. Uh, only, in, uh, only if debt is authorized can we then spend that money, but I take your point. Further discussion on the Section B? Yes. Ms. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitri Tsekras, Precinct 4. If this is the wrong section, I apologize. I do have a question about veterans' benefits. Is this the right section? Um, no, that would come under uh, public services budget expenses. So a couple more line Thank items. You. Okay. For the discussion into this section. And appearing, we will move on to Section C, which is the uh, capital. Discussion? And appearing, we will move on to Section D, debt. Discussion? Yes, Mr. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Precinct, Phil Pacino, Precinct 4. Uh, I want to, in, in accordance with the town uh, rules, Rule 11, under the conduct of town meeting, I wish to be noted as abstaining from this section, since I'm confident in the town, I own town reading bonds. So, uh, further discussion? O'Neill. Marilyn O'Neill, Precinct 4. Could you explain to me how we're not authorizing the debt when we're voting on this amount of debt for the year in terms of my question about building security? Mr. Lelajah. Project, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, by my count, there's three articles still in our future that all need to be authorized. Um, I can only tell you it's a technicality that we can't borrow money, we can't go to the debt markets, we can't borrow from the state or anyone else until we have debt authorization. Um, so the debt budget is a placeholder for how to pay for that if you approve it. If town meeting does not authorize any one of these items, um, then the, there's effectively a transfer that would happen in the future that will have a surplus. We have extra budget that we can't use. Uh, whether it's in water, which two of these are, or in the general fund, which the building security is. And in building security, I think the number was something like 560000 for total projected uh, capital and interest. Yes, Mr. Herrick. Um, Steve Herrick, uh, Precinct 8. So, uh, excuse me, uh, Bob. Just so I understand, uh, what you're saying is that we're approving the dollars, and those dollars that we're approving within that budget can only be spent for debt. And they Correct. cannot, they could not be spent on something that wasn't debt. So those are, it's not just the the bucket within the budget, the line items we're talking about here, it is the kind of money that we're spending. They could not be spent on expenses. In other words, we couldn't go out if we approve five hundred thousand dollars of debt spending. 
They can't turn around and spend $500,000 on non-debt spending for security-related items, even though it's in the same budget. Is that a correct, that is correct. interpretation? We what can only spend it on debt, and the only debt we could spend it on is stuff the town meeting has not yet authorized. Okay. There's nothing else. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, what is it, uh, what restricts us from doing this other than, not that I don't trust you, I do, <laughs> uh, but uh, what, what, is that state law? Is yes. that bylaw? Okay, state law. Yeah, it's state law and it's federal law in terms of um, municipal finance. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on section D. Not appearing, we'll move on to section E. Discussion? Okay, next is uh, section F. Yes, on the edge. Just a for my, uh, sorry, Jeff, second. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Jeffrey Corum, Precinct 7. On this uh, FinCon Reserve, I think it was mentioned that the, uh, we have not been spending that money in previous years. Are we seeing that number, the 150000 then reappear in the free cash generation when we see that report? Uh, and when is that report that we would see that? Mr. Lalasha. Uh, thanks, Mr. Moderator. Um, the general pattern over many years is that um, towns or schools, mostly town, comes to um, FinCom during the year and has a request. It could be as low as $5,000, it could be as large as, in theory, $150,000. Um, the pattern in the past has been, if it happens before a town meeting, November or April, FinCom will ask to have that replenished by town meeting so they have a full reserve fund again. Um, at the end of the year, um, if whatever the balance is left does flow to free cash. So for instance, I, I don't remember, it was a few years ago, FinCom had a less than $150,000 balance. April Town Meeting moved it back up. They didn't use any of it, so they turned the full amount, $150,000, back to free cash at the end of the year. Further discussion? Not appearing, we move on to Section G. Any discussion? Yes, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Um, I have a question on the town clerk elections, uh, G91 and G92. You had said that there's going to be two compared to three elections coming FY20. And I know one of them will be the presidential primary, which I assume will have to have more staff than um, the town election, assuming we have two separate elections. And I see that election, the way these wages are cut by almost 50%. I don't understand that. Um, and I also see that the expenses are also, that's a little closer in line with going from three down to two is down um, 28%. I don't understand how we can go that low on the wages for elections. We still have two, and one, one of those is a major election. Mr. Lelasher. Um, if I might ask the town clerk, am I right about three to two, forgetting what the presidential primary might look like? Or is it two to one? Two to one. Okay. Sorry about that. It's going from two elections, and it's hard because I go by calendar year, but we budget by fiscal. It's reducing from two planned elections to one planned election. Now, the assumption there, which may or may not prove out, is that the um, local election next spring is combined with the presidential primary, which we've done for the last two or three times. <coughs> if that doesn't happen, we may need a little bit more money. Um, you're right in terms of a primary or a presidential election being significantly more staff. Um, but there are also some fixed costs, if you will, regardless of what the election is. We have to test the equipment. Um, so a lot of the expenses are much more fixed, I guess, and the wages tend to flow much more with how many elections and what type are they. So sorry about that. It's two to one. Ms. O'Neill. Can I just do a quick follow-up? I just want to put a word in for that. I think we've done that in the past. I feel it um, negatively impacts the town election because it puts uh, collection of nominations, signatures, and things like that into the holiday period, and we end up with, you know, it just, a lot of people just kind of fall off the grid for that, and I think it's negative. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Thank you. Okay, further discussion? All right, we will move on to Section H. Any discussion? Yes. Mr. Garris, yes. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitra Tsekras, Precinct 4. So I have a question about veterans. You had said that there's a, a cut of $75,000. I didn't say 75000 What no. did you say? Um, if, I, if I'm looking at that, I just said a cut. Um, there's a reduction from 235000 in this year's budget, which we are not fully spending, to 215000 next year. Okay. Um, so what I, what I did say is we had forecast 200000 and we're not even spending that amount. Okay. So the two thirty five, I don't think we're even going to spend 200000 this year. So a question. I understand that the aging veteran population we are losing, right. but there is a tremendous veteran population that are younger than me, much younger than me. So is it possible to, and I, I'm, this is just, I'm just curious, mm -hmm. is it possible to address within that original budget or the budget that we're going to presumably pass tonight, additional attention paid to suicide rates, which are astronomical among veterans of recent and current wars, and opioid addiction, uh, homelessness, et cetera. Is that something that can be done with that money so we can spend it? Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, there's a very strict set of rules across the Commonwealth for every municipality on exactly how we can spend money. Um, what you just suggested might, might be a nice idea, but it wouldn't be addressed in this line. It might be addressed, for instance, in increasing the ARCASA budget. Um, our veterans services officer goes out and, and really does comb the town, and I mean that, for anyone that's eligible according to a strict set of rules over which we have no control over. Further discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, right here. Linda Snow Doxer, Beaver Road, Precinct 1. Um, I had a question you mentioned. It sounded like there was a balance in terms of the FTEs in the Senior Human Services um, profess professionals. And I'm wondering if you can just talk about, you said there's a decrease in the Senior Center Coordinator. I'm just wondering about what the impact of that is going to be on the programming for our seniors. We have a burgeoning population of seniors. So I was just wondering what the impact of that would be. Mr. Thank Malaysia. you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, for the actual details, uh, page 62 has a little bit of a box that describes it. But just to you know, speak words, not numbers, um, the part-time senior center coordinator was we hired the best person for the job, and she only wanted to work part-time. So we had to shift some of her tasks around, if you will. It didn't change the amount of programs offered, hours to the public. It just shifted the work within the senior center. Um, and some of it, if you actually look at the, at the Human Elder Services budget, there is a budget called administration that has all the clerical support that is used by all the divisions. So there's very likely to be a decrease in Human Elder Services staff, but it's supplemented by clerical and support staff assistance. Um, there is also uh, some amount of funding that's done off the general fund by private funds for the programs, much like the library. Further discussion? All right, we'll move on to uh, section I, finance wages. Any discussion? None, appear oh, none appearing, we will move on to section J, public safety wages. Discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeffrey Cry, I'm Precinct 7. Uh, could you re, um, re, give me a little more detail or, or reiterate what it was exactly you said about the decrease in expenses for the fire, um, something about reducing the amount for new hires? Is that, are we cutting what we're giving them or we don't expect to see as much because we're not hiring as many firefighters net for next year? Thank you. Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm uh, just looking at the police budget as an example on page 77. Um, there's a reduction of, looks like $6,500 in professional development and $7,500 in uniforms and cleaning. And that just means the new police officers had more equipment, had more training as a startup cost this year that they don't need next year. 
It's a little more dramatic in fire. Their, their equipment's a little more expensive, but the concept is with a new firefighter or a new police officer, there's a startup cost aside from their wage, and that's an expense that does not need to be carried forward. Yes. Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4, and I have a question about police expenses, and this is just out of curiosity. I've noticed that in Reading and, and in many other towns in Massachusetts, the police seem to be driving primarily, if not exclusively, SUVs as opposed to sedans. My experience has been the SUVs are more expensive. Can, can you tell me why we switch to SUVs and, and if they are, in fact, more expensive? Mr. Lager. Um For the more difficult questions, I'll have to ask the Deputy Chief to come answer. <laughs> The easy thing is they have stopped making the Ford Crown Victorias, the standard police car that we've been using, um, and the outfit of the SUVs, the Explorers that we're using, are a little bit more expensive, but we can use a lot of the existing gear. So when we buy a new cruiser, we can take some of the gear, existing gear, cages, stuff like that, and bring it into and transfer it into the Ford Explorers, where if we change to a Chevy or something like that, we can't use that. So it does save us money that way, but they stopped making the Crown Victorious, uh, Ford Crown Victorious. So we actually are, the only thing we are making now is the interceptors, which is the explorers, the SUVs. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Mr. Warren. Jamie Warren, Precinct 4, just a follow up. So that doesn't answer my question. Why do we need an SUV and why do we have to buy Ford? Can we buy another make? Because there are plenty of sedans out there. And, and save money if we don't need the SUVs. If there's a reason we need the SUVs, that, that's great. But, but what is, why do we need an SUV as opposed to a sedan? The SUVs are all-wheel drive, so during the winter we can actually get to calls as opposed to having the expense of putting chains on the cars, which has an added expense putting the chains on the cars, which break and snap when we're going to calls. And um, the DPW, which services the cars for us, can only service certain brands. Uh, mostly being the Fords. Well, there are plenty of sedans that have four-wheel drive. I, I'm just a, a, at a loss to understand why but we need that. They can't fit the equipment that we need in the car. The cages, the rifle racks, they can't fit the equipment that we need to put into the cars. So the, the cages, rifle racks will not fit in a sedan? Not in the sedans they're making, no. Not in the sedans what? That they're making currently, no. The, Who, for, that Ford is making? Correct. How about other manufacturers? We haven't, we can't, uh, we'd have to be limited to what we can use for the DPW for servicing things. We can't use uh, like a Toyota, we can't use other vehicles like that. Mr. Lasher? Just to follow up, I don't remember how many years ago, but we did go off brand with one of them, and that puts a car out of service when your own DPW can't fix it. You're then relying on a dealer uh, for fixing it. If it's a complex problem, you may not have a vehicle for two weeks. So. You know, if, if there, it's, it's one of those economies of scale thing. If there's a, a more, you know, price effective vehicle out there, we'll shift the whole fleet there over time. Um, but for right now, it's just not practical in order. Police cars, as you'd imagine, get quite a beating. They're basically on the road 24 hours a day. Um, they wear down quickly. They have a lot of equipment in them. We can't have stuff down. It's just not something we can tolerate. So I don't know if that helps answer your question. That, that does, and I understand that, but I, I'm still at a loss to why we have to go with Fords when there are many other manufacturers out there. Perhaps for the next budget cycle, we could look into competitive pricing and, and looking for a manufacturer that can apply, supply a sedan or something inexpensive if we don't need the SUVs. Mr. Lager. Well, we, we do go through a procurement process through the state that is as competitive if you're going to buy a Ford as it can be. And, you know, police departments generally all do this, and generally we get a, the power of buying of a big, a big customer, if you will. But certainly the department's open-minded to things, but we can't go start buying this one because it's cheaper this year and that one because it's cheaper the next year because, again, we have to have them useful all the time. That's all. 
for the discussion, Mr. Mon. I, I will believe I won't belabor this beyond this, but it would seem to me we keep the cars five years, I think we said, or, or less. Two or three. Two or three. Cars I buy, the warranty lasts that entire period. So if we buy this car from Ford or Toyota or Chevrolet or or Studebaker, um, <laughs> doesn't the warrant <laughs> He cover the car so we don't have to go to the DPW director, uh, DPW garage to have it fixed? Mr. Lalasha. Again, I'll restate finances aside, we can't have the vehicle offline. So even if a warranty would cover it, which, which we don't pay extra for, it goes to a dealer. You know, the dealer's going to return it as fast as it can, but not as fast as our DPW that will do whatever it takes. You see this much more often with fire equipment and fire engines in particular, because there are some problems with fire engines. We don't have the staff that can fix it. So we have to outsource the repairs. Um, that puts a vehicle out of action sometimes for a few weeks, and we actually have to borrow fire engines from other municipalities. So it's a juggling act. Um, but, but again, the police cars are not at all like any of our cars in terms of how much wear and tear they get because they literally are driven 24 hours a day until they can't be driven anymore. Further discussion? Uh, Peering? Oh, oh, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Up in the back. Kendra Cooper, Precinct 8. Um, I just have a question about animal control. Um, I noticed that there's a slight increase. But I was wondering, are there any state requirements now? Because I'm not really aware of any. And what kind of requirements do we have for our animal control officers? Yeah. Mr. Lasher. Um, this is one of the areas that's one of the few areas that's highly frustrating, at least to me. Yeah. Um, I don't think we provide enough animal control coverage in the town. Uh, for anyone that's been here for a few years, we have attempted to regionalize with just about every community around us. and. We're not necessarily on friendly terms with them anymore because they wouldn't after promising they would. Um, we should put more effort into it, but as it is now, we have one employee, um, as Stoneham calls him, it's the park and bark officer. So he does traffic control and animal control. And uh, I shouldn't say this out loud, but he prefers to do traffic control because dogs are scary. Um, there are no state regulations per se for a municipality to follow but I still will say, I don't think we, I think we could do more. Yeah, I, w I was at a recent Animal Rights Day um, in Andover last, Friday, last Saturday, and I was amazed that there still, as a, there still are no requirements. And, and that can be a problem when you have somebody, you know, somebody from the police department saying, well, you've got to get rid of your dog, or, you know, if, if like, are the chips, if we're all putting uh, chips into our, into our pets, but does anybody want them? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of wondering when an animal, you know, is missing, whose responsibility is that? You know, if, if they find a dead animal on the, in the road or, I mean, I, I just don't know exactly how we fill the gap here. Mr. Lalasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, if you will, we have one department for living animals and one for deceased animals. Gene takes care of the deceased ones. Mm. Um, that's a health issue. Um, Generally speaking, animal control um, has nothing to do with, for instance, a bad dog. You know, someone that's bitten up someone and they have to be either euthanized. We used to like to banish them. That's not legal anymore. Um, we have an animal control appeals committee that does that. Nothing to do with the police department. So there's three members. Um, we had a hearing within the last two years. It's the first one I've been part of in a long time in which they listened to the testimony of both sides and both sides ended up coming to an agreement without them needing to vote. But that's nothing to do with the function in the police department. Um, that is really stray dogs, lost dogs, dogs without collars. They have an arrangement with a local veterinarian to take care of the dog. 
and then do outreach to try to let the community know. You've probably seen it on their Facebook page. They found a dog, and I'm telling you through Facebook, the dog's not lost for more than two hours usually these days. Oh, yeah. So you get a better way. Um, yeah, uh, so you're saying that the traffic control person or the person who goes around checking to make sure that two-hour spaces are not occupied for four hours or whatever, um, that's the same person as the one who does the animal control? Correct. He's full-time, but he has two portions of his job at two different rates of pay. Okay, now, there, as far as the, the parking one, since we've, you've raised that issue, um, there was a recent uh, re uh, federal court decision in Michigan that had to do with using the chalk to determine whether how long someone had been there and that that was determined unconstitutional. So uh, I'm wondering, um, do we do that still? <laughs> I mean, what, how do we determine when a car has stayed parked? Mr. Elijah. Um, thank you. No, we, we don't do it that way, and I was kind of surprised to hear about that just this week, that that was ruled on that way. Um, no, um, the, you know, if it's, for instance, a limited amount of parking, yeah. um, the license plates are kept track of, and cars how, are pr pretty obvious. How do they do that, though? I mean, some communities have the uh, um, I, I don't know if he takes a picture of it. We, d we don't use, like, sophisticated technology that some communities do. Yeah. Um, we could have a robot do the job if we did that. Um, he just goes out and looks. He, he recognizes cars. He doesn't honestly need the license plate, but he uses it as, as an insurance. Um, again, and usually right. it's people that don't know the rules or don't think you're paying attention, and they're quite quickly corrected almost all the time. Right. Okay, well, thank you. For the discussion. Uh, oh, yes, right here. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, I'd just like to address the gentleman's comments over there about the police vehicles. Um, as many in this room, we probably feel like we live on the street that last to get plowed in the town. Um, I think many of us feel that way. Um, I, for one, would feel better knowing that the police have the correct resources if someone in my family, my neighbors, um, during a snowstorm require um, police, EMS, um, often you get multiple uh, first responders showing up. I'd feel better, uh, buy them a tank, buy them a Humvee. I think the cost difference between a sedan versus an SUV um, is negligible, and I'd rather have them show up in a vehicle that can handle it, handle the situation, than show up in a Le Car um, where they don't know what to do anything. Um, Secondly, regarding animal control, um, a few years ago we had an instance, um, there was a rabid coyote in our neighborhood. It was literally just living, sleeping under my neighbor's deck. Animal, animal control came out, uh, they assessed the situation, they did a great job. So um, I just wanted to add that because I don't want to change the police budget um, because of the vehicle situation. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Greg Savatelli, Precinct 6. Just a quick question of clarification on the ARCASA um, comment you made earlier about the federal grant being maxed out. Does that ever reset where you can then reapply for that grant? Mr. Um, there, there are many, there, there are some grants available, actually many, but there's only one really large one, which is federal, which the town did qualify for. Um, there is only one such grant, and that uh, eligibility for the town ends forever on September 30th of next fall. So going back to when our CASA was started, we started with a five-year grant. We then did not get the continuation of that, and town meeting and the taxpayers had to fund it for one year, and then we got it with a one-year lag for another five years. So that's been the 11-year history of our CASA. And we knew full well all along that at some point we're going to have to pick this expense up on our own, if you will. Okay, thank but you. But there are smaller grants that they still do uh, apply for and qualify for, but they do not pay hundred odd thousand dollars worth of wages. Okay, I just didn't know after like a few years if you reset or not, so. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Snow Doctor. Linda Snow Docs are Precinct 1. I just wanted to enthusiastically thank the town for stepping up to refund, uh, well, fund RACASA because I've seen the good that it's done and how important it is. 
and um, Erica and Julianne has, have done a really good job at both um, stretching the funds that we have and finding other um, grants to do programs, collaborating with other towns. And I think it's really important and I'm really grateful that we're going to continue funding this important program. Thank you. For the discussion. All right, we'll move on to uh, section K, which is public works. Discussion. Not appearing. We'll move on to, oh, what did I miss? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. I have two questions. Uh, one is, a small thing that I'm troubled about is the absolutely ugly appearance of all the trash cans in our downtown. They don't work, they um, are dirty, and they are completely un you know, peeling and down to the primer of the red underneath the black. And every time I go downtown, I'm like, oh my god, I'm taking pictures like these are so ugly. So I wanted to know if we have some money in to get some ones that work better. The pretty decorative ones that we put in there don't function with all the restaurants that we have down there and the trash people are putting in. Uh, we don't have enough opportunities for recycling, though I know those are very expensive, but we need something that's a different design and more functional and easier to, for the staff to clean up. Mr. Lelasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I think it's next week. We actually, we, we received a grant to study the downtown um, economic development opportunities, if you will, and in particular to look at different ways we could form an organization either inside of town government or outside of town government. Um, and I have no doubt that that'll be one of the recommendations. So if it happens within the FY20 process, we would have, and I would have no problem using economic development expense money to do exactly what you said, if that's the recommendation that would come forward. Okay, thanks. My second question is, um, a couple months ago I was um, in the uh, town hall parking lot and I noticed this very shiny car that belongs to engineering. I don't know if it was new or just washed, but it brought to my mind a question that um, are we making or are we going to be working towards getting some uh, hybrid and electric vehicles in our fleet? I think it's we're past due to uh, undertake that initiative. Mr. Olasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. We have talked to the light department about that because they've, if you will, started a test or beta plan of that. Um, we're open-minded for some of the town vehicles, but certainly not for public safety. They have a different need and response time. Um, but yeah, the town is open-minded. Um, as you know, the, the difficulty is the cost is higher. So you're making a statement, but you're also paying additional money. But we don't have a problem with that if that's what ultimately uh, the community would support. Ms. O'Neill. Thank you, I appreciate that. It's not a statement, it's actually planning for the future and you know, positive impact our environment, which is suffering. And it's, it's not a political statement, or I, I know you didn't use that word, Bob, but it is more, it's, it's the future. To me, it's the future. It is the only way in this uh, realm for the future in terms of uh, transportation. Thank you. Mr. Lula. I don't disagree with you. My only comment will be, this is probably something that the town can't be at the forefront of because we need to have vehicles that can be in use all the time and if there's not enough charging stations around for instance for electric we have to wait we have to wait until the technology is really available for our needs but i don't disagree with your general comments certainly but as a practical matter operationally we have to be real careful further discussion all right we'll move to the second half second piece of the k the uh, public works snow and ice any discussion not appearing. We'll move on to section L. Library. No. Okay. Section M, core facilities. Mr. O'Neill. John O'Neill, Precinct 4. It was a question because uh, I couldn't really ascertain from the budget. Is, was there a possibility of having Thursday morning hours? Oh, for you know, the library? Mr. Elijah? Oh. 
Um, for years now, no, nothing from until 1 o'clock on Thursdays. Mr. Moderator, if you don't mind backing up to Section L, um, we could have Amy come up and answer that question. Oh, you're right. It's a library. Okay. Is there any, any objection to backing up one? No. Okay. Um, right now, there's no plans to increase to the four, uh, incre uh, to add those hours on Thursday mornings. Uh, simply, we added Sunday hours as an alternative, and it seems to work out with better schedule. We were required to be open by 59 hours a week by the state. We are open 63 with the hours on Sundays. So, it's just an expense that's not in the budget. So, okay. Further discussion. All right. We'll move on to Section M. Core facilities. Any discussion? Not appearing. We move on to section. Oh, excuse me. That was M through M91. Now M92. Town buildings. Discussion. No. Okay. Next is line uh, item use the use section. School school department. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Sakaris. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitri Tsekras, Precinct 4. Um, thank you. So I have a question. I'm curious on the first breakdown of costs, that very first chart that you put up, where it talks about um, you know, the percentage of things going up. This, this chart? Yes. OK. I will confess to being surprised and not in a good way, at the 1.4% for a regular day, which you said was for like teachers and everything that happens every day at all of the schools. So, and I, I also want to say I appreciate the complexities of this town mm -hmm. and school. I, would, I, I wish that number was higher because it translates into, I think, more people and teaching, and I think that's important. Why is that number significantly lower than all of the other numbers, including administration? Thank you. Mr. Doherty. So we, we added, uh, this is based on the, don't forget the FY19, several positions were added in the override to the FY19 budget. So the smaller increase percentage is because we had a larger base to begin with. Because we also added, don't forget, a, a significant amount of funding from the override for, to, for retaining staff. And so the, the wage increase is higher than 1.4%. The increase in general is higher than 1.4%. It's based on the FY19 base. Further discussion, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Um, I know that a lot of people like transparency. When I went through the budget book, I something like 90 some odd pages on the school department alone, that translates to 11,000 pieces of paper or five, uh, five boxes of paper. And since we can only vote the bottom line, I personally think that's a waste of money. Further discussion? Okay. Further discussion? Uh, yes. Ms. Sekras. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Demetrius Sekras, Precinct 4. I have two questions, if I may. Why couldn't you find elementary school chorus teachers? Are they not out there? You said you couldn't find them. Mr. You Martin. couldn't fill the positions. No, it's a stipended position after school. It's not, it's not a teaching position during the day. It's a stipended position after school. And we posted it, and no one applied for it. OK. And then the other thing, thank you. The other question that I have, and I'm not sure it's a question, but I, I will confess naive horror at the fact that we have homeless kids in this district. And what else are we doing about that other than the bus? I mean, you said the number went up. So we have seen an increase uh, over the last few years in the number of students who are homeless. Uh, the transportation is to provide, to get them from wherever they are in their temporary housing. 
which a lot of times is not in Reading, right. to uh, the Reading Public Schools. So Once they're in the Reading Public Schools, we provide the same types of services and education that we would any other student of course, that so, may need it. So maybe this is a question also for the town manager. Is the town actively doing something to help end this situation in a positive way? Thanks. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, as John mentioned, many of these students do not live in Reading, so the town certainly has no authority to tell some of the town or city what to do. Um, but those that are living in Reading, yes, absolutely, the human elder services, again, the human portion, if you will, um, does deal with families. Um, you know, to end their plight, I'm not sure we have resources to do that per se, but whatever uh, programs are available, whatever assistance available, they're connected to it by us, if they live in Reading. Mr. Darty. And Dimitri, just so you're aware, it, it, if we know the needs, we also connect with social service agencies and provide, we connect them with wraparound services that we, we know of could be available through state agencies. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Grant from Precinct 4. I just, um, I have some concern about the special education line, um, just because you know, it does grow much faster than the overall budget. And if you look at the incremental dollar amount year on year, that also has been going up such that it's a third of the budget now. And then in the comments here, there's potential for additional costs related to if there will be further out-of-district placements. Um, you know, each individual year, we can sort of say we can manage this, but from a longer-term perspective, it seems to be a growing problem. And I'm just not, maybe I'm just not aware of the steps that are being taken to address it. Sure. Dr. Dr. Darney? So, and Bob can attest to this too when he meets with other town managers and when I'm meeting with other superintendents, this is not just a Reading issue. Um, I will tell you that we have been actively discussing this topic with our uh, state legislators to fully fund circuit breaker uh, at the 75% for next year and also lobbying to try to get transportation included as part of that. So circuit breaker is a mechanism that the state provides um, an amount of funding um, after a, 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 the cost of the, the student services go uh, four times the foundation budget limit, which right now is low $40,000 um, per student. So that's, that's one avenue that we're pursuing to try to get additional um, aid back into Reading to address those needs. But the factors that are leading to the increased budget um, is a variety of factors. One is that we are seeing, first of all, an increased complexity of student needs um, at various levels, both in the primary levels, uh, which we do everything we can to try to keep students in district programs, which is why you see increases um, in, in this budget in FTE for staffing. Um, if, it's, if it's out of district, um, that's an increase in tuition. So, for example, if a student is already in an out-of-district placement for uh, particular types of services, but their needs increase and they are required to go to a different out-of-district placement, which may be more restrictive, that's an increase in cost. And that has happened uh, in this budget, that has happened for a few students, which you're, you're talking about three, four hundred thousand dollar increase with a few students. Um, the other thing that also happens is that um, private out of district placements um, every so many years can uh, a petition to receive an increase higher than uh, what is customarily around two, two, two and a half percent, two point nine percent. Um, and they do that through a petition process to the Operations of Service Division uh, at the state level. And sometimes those increases for, a, for one student could go as high as 40%. Uh, certainly when we're aware of them, we go to those meetings and we, we push back and we question why they would need that much of an increase. But if you have a couple of students or three students or four students in that out of district placement and that tuition goes up that, that much, that's an increase in our budget as well. 
And then we have the, the normal contractual increases for uh, transportation. Uh, we, do all of, we do the majority of our transportation um, through the SEAM Collaborative, and so that's negotiated uh, to try to consolidate bus, bus transportation as much as possible. Um, and so we try to get the best rates possible through that, and we're always looking at other ways to, to maximize our transportation costs. But a lot of those um, extra costs are based that we are seeing an increased complexity in student needs um, in, in the students that we're servicing. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right now. Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, regarding uh, special education, uh, you sort of beat me to the punch, um, but petitioning for more funding and stuff is, um, you know, treating the symptom, um, the root cause, and I know there has been some efforts. I know um, we partnered with Landmark to review the uh, middle school program. Um, is there allocations in this budget to address, um, there's a lot of positives and there's some things that need improvement. Mm -hmm. um, is there, um, money allocations in that budget to address those concerns? Our, our plan over the next few years is to take a look at all of our in-district programs to see how we can strengthen them and, and, and make them better. We're always looking at ways to improve it, yes. And then um, this is a multi-phase question. Right. Um, I, I got involved with this a few years ago, knee deep up to my neck. Um, with um, the new mandatory dyslexia screening, um, mm -hmm. kids are now gonna be detected um, and will need to be addressed at a much earlier age. Um, the confusion by everyone, the, or pushed off, or just misdiagnosis, whatever, um, is not no longer going to be pushed off until you know later years. It's going to be early on. So I see these costs exponentially increasing if our in-district programs aren't bolstered to the point where um, we can address the needs of those children. Um, because I think for the most part, no one really wants to send their kid out of district, away from their friends, right. um, the, the extra burden it puts on families and stuff like that. And legal proceedings for both families and the town to get to where we need to be to do what's right for the child um, is also an expense incurred. So in bolstering our in-district programs to have, so we have less children out of district and that number is going to increase incredibly with this new mandate. Um, would I, I, I feel we should add money to the school budget to address these programs um, and and bolster them up to the highest degree we can. Almost be a leader in it rather than a follower. Sure. So um, the dyslexia screening we will be implementing uh, in this upcoming year. Uh, we've not received any guidance yet from the Department of Education, uh, which a lot of district, uh, all the districts are waiting to see what guidance we're going to get. Um, we will obviously do the best we can to find the right screener. A screener is not al always the magical answer either. So right. we use it, as, we will be using it as a tool to identify uh, students that may require additional services. And um, again, are we addressing those um, comments from the partnership with Landmark and carrying those through to the elementary level and the high school level. So you're referring to the Orkin report? Yes. Yes, not Landmark. Landmark was oh. providing professional development, professional development for, our, yes, for our staff, but okay. you're referring to the, or the Melissa Orkin correct. report. I was a little mistaken. Yes. yes correct. So the Melissa Orkin report, our, our teachers and, and um, Sharon Stewart and administrators, we've been, they've been working on that all year, yes, okay. implementing, looking at different things and implementing different things. And with the new director coming on board July 1st, who has a background in this area, that will help support it as well. Okay, I'd like, I'd like to see this town be a leader in that than I would rather too. than a follower. So I, I know too. it costs a lot of money, but the way to that gentleman's point, it's already increasing exponentially. Mm -hmm. So I think in the future, in the long run, spend now, save later. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Uh, Phillips? Mr. Moderator, I am not Linda, <laughs> but she needs assistance temporarily here with okay. the mic.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I am Linda Phillips, Precinct 7. Um, in my review of the budget, um, I requested several uh, questions separately to the school department. And I would like to thank you, Superintendent Doherty, for providing me with all the answers to the questions. Thank you very much. Some of the questions and the answers um, apparently were never asked by anyone who reviewed the budget because it did take six weeks for me to acquire the answers, which is a little puzzling to me, but taxpayer funds for mandated K through 12 educational programs and instruction are being used to supplement optional non-mandated Reading Public School Enterprise endeavors into child care services that were never approved by town meeting, the legal appropriating body for the town. The all-day kindergarten program, the costs, are mostly salary driven with classroom supplies and furniture. Not included in the program costs are the costs for employee benefits or the cost for heat, electricity, and utilities, as well as custodial care. Benefit costs, we are told, are part of the town's accommodated costs, which are paid off at the top of the budget between town and schools. Why are we funding benefits for the all-day kindergarten program and extended day programs through town accommodated costs when the Department of Revenue says Revolving funds should be used for that specific purpose. Mr. Doherty. The, the only piece I'll, I'll answer is that full day kindergarten, uh, the research has shown, is in the best interest of students. And ideally, we would love to have full day kindergarten tuition free in our school district. And unfortunately, we, we do not have that right now. But we do have a very large percent of of families that have chosen to pay for the tuition for their children to get the additional piece of kindergarten uh, for their children. So it is in the best interest of students. The research is very clear on that. That wasn't the question I asked. That's the answer I have. So there is uh, no reason why the town is paying, taxpayers are paying for the cost, for the benefits, for these optional programs that are supposed to be fully funded by the I don't have an answer for that, I'm sorry. No one in the town has an answer for that? Who made the decision to take the money from the town instead of using revolving funds? I don't have an answer for that, I'm sorry. Well, I guess I'll have to go someplace else to get the answer. Um, as the state only mandates a half a day kindergarten, how can an IEP de be developed for more than the required classroom time that in Reading is an optional fee-based program paid by users and taxpayers? In other words, how, if the state says that a child with special needs is required to have a regular half-day kindergarten program, how can you write an IEP up that requires a child to attend longer than what the state mandates? We do have students uh, in our district that are kindergarten age that do require full day kindergarten services as required in their IEP. The extended day program has positions specifically in the program for a regular coordinator, staff accountant, building monitors, site coordinators, head teachers, teachers, assistant teachers, para support, high school helpers, substitute staff totaling 100 staff members. Who knew that? No one in town apparently knew that. I just learned that. 14 of those members also qualify for benefits, and those costs are paid for by Reading taxpayers instead of the people who utilize those services. And I guess I'm not going to get an answer to that. When did Reading start creating IEPs requiring taxpayer-funded after-school child care services? There are some children who participate in extended day for no fee because it's written in their IEP. Again, how can an IEP require a child to participate in an optional parent paid program? Federal law requires us that if a student is participating in an activity outside of the school day that we have to provide those accommodations and services um, that 
are necessary as near IEP. Well, would, wouldn't the parents be paying for that service if the parents want them to be the Parents would pay for the tuition piece, for the, but they would not be paying for the rest of it. Okay, thank we you. We would have to provide those services as required by federal law. Um, the revenues for the extended day program Excuse me, for one second, Mr. Moderator, the extended day program is not in the FY20 budget. So I don't know, if these, okay. I don't know if these questions are pertinent then, to... Then we are now outside the scope of this. Okay. Well, yes. taxpayer money does fund these programs, and who reviews, the, who reviews the accountability the, the school of how taxpayer budget. money is spent? Okay. Well, the school well, department, but the extended day program is not in the budget the town meeting is voting on this evening. But the, the money to fund it is... Is the money to fund it in this? Uh, yes. No. It, no. It's okay. Not. The answer is no, no then. It's not. Okay, so the, this is not That's not accurate according to the information he's given me. I just wanted to know why the revenues have declined by a half a million dollars since 2017, despite the program's growth and in increase in participation. Is there any special we reason? We did reduce the tuition, I believe, two years ago for uh, extended day programs. So that's why there's five, a half a million dollars less in there. Because we reduced the tuition uh, to the families that were participating in it. Okay, thank you. And the money does come out of the school budget. Okay, further discussion on the school budget. Yes, over here. Marianne Downing, Precinct 3. Um, I had a different question, but just as a quick follow-up to something Linda said, because I'm confused. If extended day isn't part of the, um, the budget we're voting on, why is the extended day revolving account in the school budget? We list all of the revolving accounts in the budget book for the purposes of the school committee. So where does extended day fall? Is it, is it on the town side of the budget then? No, it's a revolving account in the school budget, but it is not funded by the town funds. Okay, so because the the extended day page says it's it's self-supporting, but yes, it's a self -supporting. except except for the accommodated costs, it's self-supporting. So the f the fees pay for that is correct. Okay, yes. So just my question actually was just a follow up on the um, elementary music sure. um, chorus. When sure. when you say it was posted, like where? Where does it get posted? So we post all of the advisorship positions. Uh, usually it's around this time. I believe it, we've already posted them for next year. April 1st is usually the time we post them. Um, and those are all of the clubs and activity stipended positions that are in the collective bargaining agreement. Right, but where is it posted on the HR page with all the job listings or somewhere where RTA people see it? Like where? Yeah, the, the Writing Teachers Association receives all of those job postings, yes. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, in the back. Hi, I'm Nick Boyvin, Precinct 7. Um, two quick questions um, for the superintendent of the town uh, manager. On page 186, there's a memo from the town manager to the superintendent that talks about additional $300,000 that was added by the town manager to the school budget. I was wondering if um, either the superintendent and town manager could briefly summarize that because I think it speaks to one of the points raised by uh, someone, I think three speakers ago, gentleman who's sitting uh, close by where I'm standing. Uh, and then the second separate question, um, unrelated, the, an earlier speaker mentioned homeless students and I just, maybe the superintendent for you, a question on, my understanding is that that's a, a very specific legal definition. I think it's the McKinney-Vento definition. Correct. And so if a student lacks a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence, they're considered quote unquote homeless. So for instance, foster children could be considered under that definition. Maybe you could speak to that point. So those two points of clarification in either order. Thank you. So Nick, Nick I was on the first question that you had. I'll... Just the, um... The first one was page 186, the memo yes. about the 300,000. Just explain that to, to the group. Um, about the 300,000? Yeah, where okay, that came so from, the process behind that, because I think it addresses the questions about special ed and second, the definition of homelessness. Thanks. Mr. Lelasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, after listening to the school committee budget from the pleasure of my living room, 
um, it was clear they, they had a shortfall, an unexpected one in special education funds available for next year. Um, the out of district funds are set, if you will, in the fall uh, by consent of all the elected or the school committee and the, and the select board and the FinCom. Um, and there was just a late development that there was more costs than were known in the fall. That doesn't mean we normally can do anything about it. The superintendent said we have somewhere between 300,000 and a larger number that we may, may well need to come to a future town meeting in November mid-year or April mid-year and ask for funds. And we will likely have a higher baseline expense in future budgets by that amount. Um, we were fortunate enough, um, and, and once the budget passed to the school committee, they couldn't vote extra, well, they could vote an unbalanced budget but I have to balance it. And they voted a balanced budget, which included the lower amount of special ed funds. Um, when it came to me, I had the luxury of seeing that health insurance was better behaved than we thought in the fall. Special ed was more expensive than we thought in the fall, so I just shifted money. Uh, $300,000 from health insurance not needed. The special ed very clearly needed. To answer the question about uh, McKinney-Vento is a federal law that applies to students um, who are homeless. They may either be displaced uh, due to some tragedy, such as a house fire or something like that, or for other reason, uh, economic or, uh, or illness or foster. Um, where their last residence is, the town that they reside in, is the town, the district that is responsible for um, providing uh, education for that student unless there is a mutual agreement with, with the school district that they are currently in and then there would be some sort of financial um, discussion with that. So one of the pieces that we are required to do for a student who is defined as homeless is we need to provide the transportation for them for wherever they are to um, back to Reading each day so that they can attend school. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, ben Reem, uh, Precinct 7. My question is for Dr. Doherty. And when he did the slide on expense drivers, um, it was interesting to see you know, the lines you know, for the different departments and um, when the question was posed about like, like a 0.1% or point, sorry, 0.1 is really 10% and that was going to be paid for by a stipend. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And I also understand maybe stay at home moms or dads might want to stay at home, but also get out and make 10%. My question is what about, you know, are you paying lip service to the other, you know, disciplines like social studies or math if it's like, 20% or 30% or percentages that can't be easily explained away by um, stipends. And, and the concern I have is if it's a funky number like, like 40%, that perhaps the people that are available for that percentage are people that weren't hired or you know, at other schools and we're kind of giving the ulcerants. Thank you. Dr. Doherty. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm confused by what your question is. Are you talking about the FTEs or? I'm talking about the percentage of FTEs and about whether it's 10% or 20%. I mean, it seems like there would be a different calculus for candidates. I, I'm wondering about the reality of 30% for a certain discipline. Are you talking about, you talking about this slide? Yeah, yes. So an FTE, uh, for, for, in, for a lot of these, they're paraeducator positions. So the FTE is the number of hours that they would be working biweekly. So to be a full-time equivalent paraeducator, you'd be a 35-hour or 70-hour biweekly position. A lot of times we don't require that amount of hours for a paraeducator position, or we have a part-time person already, and we just need to increase their hours to, to address the, uh, the student needs. So that's why you see fractions of FTEs. The one, the one point 
to regular education teacher? Is that, is that what you're referring to? No, I, I'm actually referring to most of, of them. I don't understand um, point 70, point 43. I, I mean, I'm just wondering what quality, I mean, it, it's like we're acknowledging the need for further education by discipline, but the fractions just don't make sense to me in terms of the candidates and the quality of the education they can provide. So some of these positions are to uh, increase positions that already exist in the district that are uh, smaller FTEs. So that's part of it. But when we're talking about paraeducators, they're hourly employees. We convert them to FTEs for budgetary purposes. Okay, so these are not professional educators working at... No, no, these are paraeducators. So the, the professional educators would be the teachers. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Further discussion? Not appearing. We will move on to Section uh, W, Water Enterprise. Any discussion? Not appearing. We'll move on to Section uh, the Sewer Enterprise, Section X. Next is Section Y, Stormwater Enterprise Fund. Any discussion? Somewhere in the back? Yes, over right here. Uh, thank you, Dimitri Sekris, Precinct 4. So, on page 171 in the warrant, um, it explains that there's a difference between the way that stormwater is paid for by residences versus commercial. And my question is, again, sort of picking up on what Ms. O'Neill was talking about, planning for the future, is it possible that the select board going forward could look for ways to incentivize homeowners, as well as commercial, to convert more of their property so that storm water doesn't run off, but rather returns to the water table? And I'm not talking just about rain barrels, although that's a really good start. I'm talking about more pervious surfaces, less grass, et cetera. Is that something that could happen? Thanks. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, it could happen, and it does happen. Um, there is an abatement program offered up to half the cost of the stormwater fund, depending on what the resident, or honestly much more often the business, has done to mitigate their stormwater impact. Further discussion? All right, we'll move on to the last section, Section Z, the peg access. Any discussion? Oh, yes, over here. Mr. Set. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, so I think this is, yeah, this is the same slide here. So I, I understand the background in terms of your explanation earlier of why we're now seeing this. Um, so this obviously represents the kind of the income side. Um, and obviously with the other enterprise funds, we see kind of the expenditures as well, which includes ongoing expenses, capital and debt. Um, so a couple, couple questions. So first of all, the intent of this though is basically, as you said, a pass-through. We, we contract out with our CTV and they basically take everything here effectively up to the amount that's authorized. Um, but we don't see any of that, right? So there's no, they're not submitting a budget to us or to you for that matter. It's just a pass-through, or is there some requirement around that? Um, can you just explain how that works? Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the only requirement is what you as a body might require in the future. I hope you give a little bit of leeway this year because it was thrown together rather fast, but the town accountant and I have seen budgets. Um, because of this, largely, RCTV is uh, looking to change fiscal years to match ours. So in the next 18 months or six months, we're not sure, there'll be a lot of financial work that they need to do to catch on to this new way of doing business. If future town meetings want to see a more detailed budget from RCTV, again, I would hope you let it go this year, um, but that certainly would be available. But just to be clear, this is not taxpayer money. 
This is our ratepayer money, and I'm not certain that you have any authority to change their budget. You can fund it lower if you don't like what you see, or higher if you know you don't like what you see. But you don't have any authority within the line item itself, if you will. Right. So, so, so it, again, it's like the enterprise funds for water and sewer as well. So right. I understand. Um, so, and I certainly am, am, am fine with that. Um, one thing to consider, because um, I, 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 although I'm not exactly sure what that need might be, but having some reserves in this, if that's a, mm -hmm. a, pro a probability of being able to do, maybe there's capital pieces that have to be purchased to support things over the long term. Uh, maybe there's some, you know, to, to, to account for down years, depending on how this revenue. Um, I, I would just, I would just posit that that's something we might want to think about uh, from a from a managerial perspective of this. To your point, we may not necessarily be able to cut that budget or or go into the specifics of a line item, but putting some money aside from a reserve perspective to address once we understand what those budgetary needs are, because if we're just throwing money over the wall to them every year at whatever is available, I mean, I mean no, that's not really the intent, but no, that's, um, that's that good. we at least have a little bit of um, control over that. So, all right, thank yeah, you. I, I certainly agree with your point, and as it is now, RCTV does have those reserves, but they're just not part of this enterprise fund. But if they had unexpected costs, they have a savings account, let's just say. Um, well, this is all new, so we're less certain. Can they transfer and would there be any sense of transferring the surplus they have into this fund to be a surplus here? Well, so, and I, so they do have resources should unexpected things happen. So just as a quick follow-up to your point, um, this being new, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe that was part of what the state, again, was trying to accomplish yeah. was to say, Could okay, be. well, where is, you know, what, it, what, is the, what are those reserves? What, what, you know, what does the town have to fall back upon if we're relying on them to provide these services? If the answer is there's nothing in that bank account and all of a sudden revenues go off the wall, we have no services and that's not what we want. So, yeah. um, The town accountant and I spent some time trying to figure out what to present to town meeting and we went with the easier version, but your point's well taken and certainly more detail could be provided at a future town meeting. Um, and, and our CTV in the future would be more than willing to provide it. Okay, I think that'd be helpful. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Herrick. Um, <clears throat> Steve uh, Herrick, Precinct 8. Um, I'm just curious, uh, Bob, you said earlier that the way this works is we've, we're basically saying they're authorized to access this enterprise fund up to $600,000 assuming that the subscriptions for Comcast, Verizon, whatever that other line is there, mm -hmm. amount to 600. If there isn't 600 there, they can't spend it. Um, if they hit 600, they can't go over. Are we, is there any reason we couldn't just say, spend everything that's in that account or would it spend whatever funds you have? And we're not really trying to do anything different to them this year. We're just trying to check a box and meet a requirement, correct? That's correct. Okay, um, so that's one question I have is, is there any reason we should necessarily restrict them? I, I understand there's actually, uh, there are estimates here for Comcast and Verizon uh, services or income that they're gonna get. Uh, what's your estimates? And they may come in lower or higher. The other question I have is, I was kind of on the impression that um, RCTV does, they do have other sources of income. They do advertising on their own. They hold functions there for which I believe they get paid something. I'm sure it's not tons and tons of money, but they've got their own budget outside of this. Right. And that's kind of outside of the purview. So we're really only talking about, I'm not even sure what we're talking about here. We're talking about an enterprise fund that they get access to and we're supposed to be keeping an eye on, right? That's another complication in terms of them showing you a budget, because you're right, they have other sources of revenue that have no place in this room. So they have to figure out how to allocate the budget they have to the different sources of revenue. That's one of the complications. Now, their other sources aren't huge, but the fact of the matter is their budget is larger than this enterprise fund would suggest because there are additional revenues. And DOR did make it quite clear that those additional revenues are, if you will, none of our business. It's theirs. So it's only this piece of it. It's the part that comes in from the, from the two providers. services that lands in this Correct. enterprise fund that we care about at this point. But if we were to say spend up to 650 or 700 or 800, it doesn't really change anything except that they wouldn't hit a limit at some point. Um, that's correct. When we first discussed the number, we, we figured we'd just give you the best guess at what the number would actually be. Okay. Um, 
you could pick 700,000, but you can't just say spend whatever comes in. You have to actually vote a number. Yeah. Um, Do, we're uh, fairly certain from DOR that they can't spend more than you authorize. But again, this is all new. Yeah. So we wanted to be a little careful. Was the um, RCTV board okay with this approach? I mean, was saying 600, is that number? They'd say, yeah, sure, we can live with that. I, I can't really answer for the board, but during the negotiations, this was discussed and agreed to, and, and I never heard of an objection from the board, so I, I assume they are. Okay, thank you. Yes, right here. Matt McLeod brings precinct two. To that end, can, with this money, can they spend this on a first dollar basis, so just allocate the first 600000 that they get to, to this, and then after that dip into their other revenue sources, or is there some ratio or other constraint on it? Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you. They can do whatever they want. They have the authority to do it now. It doesn't change their authority, other than to put a possible ceiling on how much they could plan to spend based on what comes in. And again, the, the contract between us will specify a little more detail. The plan is to change as little as possible other than this mechanism. We'll still, you know, the, the payments come in through my office. Within a short period of time, we turn them around and we give them the money. That won't change. Mr. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Phil Pacino, Precinct 4. Uh, I happen to be the auditor for several uh, community television uh, uh, groups. They are all 501c organizations. Many of them, if the revenue is over half a million dollars, require an audit. The audit is posted on the Attorney General's website. You can go in any time and look at, look at many of them. They're all there on this. Um, my question, one of the things that I'm concerned about is the revenue that comes in from the cable TV providers comes in after the end of each quarter. Is this going to be on a cash basis or is this going to be on an accrual basis? Because many of the cable TV entities report on the accrual basis. You know, they record a receivable at the end of the year and many of them are calendar year ends at, at this point too. It's still a lasher. Um, thanks for the moderator. That, that, was, that was, I guess, surrounding one of our concerns that um, if town meeting didn't approve this and needed more information and wanted to come back in November, for instance, they couldn't spend any money, any of this money. So, you know, were that the case, we would have asked you to authorize a smaller budget. Um, our understanding is, um, even though the revenues have not come in, if they were contractually agreed to, they can spend them starting July 1st. Further discussion? None, none appearing. We have now completed all of the sections, and we are now ready to vote on the entire budget. The page flipped here. So the um, move that the, the motion is to move that the town approve the proposed uh, fiscal 2020 budget, exclusive of state and county assessments, in the amount of 117 billion 31,807. Yeah. Is there any final discussion on this? Not appearing. We are ready for the vote. All those in favor of the, the entire budget, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the budget carries. We have a motion to adjourn until Monday, April 28th. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. This town meeting stands adjourned until Monday.